good to see you again. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we're coming to you from Appalach Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina. We're currently in the midst of this uh, very important study, uh, questioned. Uh, truth is being questioned all around us. And so we felt the, the need to launch this series, Truth Question Study Series. Uh, today we're going to look at uh, something that our Lord said uh, that drew out the motive behind uh, the curiosity that a lot of people had uh, regarding Jesus in his day. Curiosity is still uh, a big factor in how people think, uh, what they're willing uh, to entertain, and what they are not willing to entertain, as we move deeper and deeper now into what has been labeled by our contemporary historians as the postmodern era in American history, in fact, it's the postmodern world today, uh, we need to know more and more about what, what drives our thinking. So today we're going to talk about miracles. Are miracles still happening? And it's very important for us to get a biblical perspective of what we are dealing with with this current culture of questioning and doubting everything uh, that we have known to be foundational truth. So today as we get into this, uh, we'll be in John chapter 10. I want you to find your way there to the 10th chapter of John's Gospel we want to open in prayer, and in recent days, I was just uh, speaking to some other folks here at the church a few minutes ago, and of late, I have had a tremendous awareness of the changes that are happening in, in, in our area here, in our local churches here. We are part of the Three Rivers Baptist Association uh, here in upstate South Carolina, it covers a pretty large uh, area of two uh, separate counties in South Carolina. And uh, we're seeing now where more and more of what used to be the Bible Belt of America is more and more secularized. And this, this very, very disturbing postmodern trend is moving uh, in, in our area. So... Uh, you are probably dealing with it where you are as well. That's why we built the time we did last week in our study to talk about what postmodernism is. Today, we're going to continue by focusing more on what Jesus said and did uh, and how, they, how that was received by those around him. It wasn't postmodernism in those days but it was, uh, it was skepticism of a different variety, religious skepticism, uh, to be more specific. So let's get into uh, our study today, having prayer, ask God to open our hearts and minds. It's far more important that the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts than anything this man or any other man will say. Father, we love you. It's our joy to open your word once again together. We have folks across the, the country watching and listening and studying with us together, and we thank you. We pray today that as we look at the 10th chapter of John, that you will speak to our hearts and help us to understand the biblical truth and the biblical perspective of the things that we're seeing, hearing, and experiencing in our present time. We ask you, Lord, to help us to come away with a deeper understanding of truth and help us to be more capable in our presentation of the gospel as we live our life for Jesus in this ever-troubling world in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to begin with the 20th verse, uh, 22nd verse of this 10th chapter. Jesus is speaking in the temple area. He was at Jerusalem at the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter. So this is what we would modern, uh, modern day call the Festival of Hanukkah. It's the Jewish 
equivalent to our Christmas season. So when we're reading these words, this is the time of the year that Jesus is, is ministering uh, at the temple. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him. Every time we find the Jews pursuing Jesus, it was not to follow him, but it was to cast doubt. It was to attempt to trap and manipulate him into saying or doing something for which they could accuse and condemn. So they gather round about him and they say unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. That sounds reasonable enough, doesn't it? We have a lot of that going on today where the world wants us Christians to come up with empirical evidence, they call it. God has given us creation. God has given us history. He's given us many, many, many infallible signs of who he is, what he has done, and his plan and purpose for humanity. There's no need for miracles, and yet the world demands the sensationalization that goes with something uh, hype, something supernatural. So here's what Jesus said in verse 25. I told you, I told you the truth, and ye believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Jesus was not going around secretively doing things. He did everything in the open. He spoke in the open. His miracles were out in the open. There was no doubt that Jesus was declaring himself to be the Messiah, and yet they still question and still see something more. Now watch. This is very important what he says next. But ye believe not. Here's why. Because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. And they and I know them, and they follow me. So the question here was, would Jesus do another miracle? Would he do something sensational? Now, uh, today... The question we ask is, are miracles still happening? Does God still do supernatural things in our world? The short answer is an unequivocal yes. Yes, God is still doing supernatural things. Miracles happen every single day. What we have, uh, what we have come to, uh, this place of, of agnosticism and skepticism and unbelief is, that now we want to label such occurrences as supernatural or we want some scientific explanation uh, that would explain it away. Postmoderns question everything. Their whole default setting is prove it or I will not believe. They have already turned the switch off. And they're basically demanding that you reach into their hearts and turn the switch on because they are saying in no, no uncertain terms, I don't believe. Jesus says to them here, to, the, to these religious people, you don't believe. And here's why, because you're not one of mine. We're going to build on that a little bit later, but hold that thought because it's the key Paul says something in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that's extremely important to us here, and it's that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Paul goes on to say they are foolishness to that natural man. It is beyond their realm, beyond their scope of comprehension to wrap their minds around the spiritual. In fact, Paul goes on to say, neither can they know them. Here's why. They are spiritually discerned. We, uh, we have a modern equivalent to this. Uh, it's called frequency. Uh, we have incredible communications uh, technologies that are all around us everywhere all the time. Uh, in this room, while we're uh, filming this, uh, 
There are, there are unseen signals, though. These various devices are talking to one another. Uh, there are phone systems. There's all sorts of communication systems. But something very important must be uh, available, and that is they must have a signal, and they must be on the same signal because there are many signals out there. Now, watch this. Very careful. The only way that a human being can understand the Word of God is to be a child of God. Without the Spirit, you and I are incapable of discerning spiritual things. That's the truth of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We have another default that works against this spiritual discernment thing, and it's that our culture, our culture is very much choosing, willfully choosing to live independent of God. Uh, it, it's sad that the creature somehow is so dark, it's so rebellious that we actually have a desire to live independent of the one who made us. This is why the theory of evolution and a lot of other scientific hypotheses uh, have so much attraction is because they attempt to explain reality apart from God or independent from God. God made us and everything that pertains to our life is intricately intertwined with our connection to our creator. And when a person has thrown that off and is seeking to live independent of God, Nothing on the spiritual side is going to make any sense to them whatsoever. So they explain away the supernatural. It's also very important that we understand God's perspective in supernatural events. When God chose both Old Testament and New Testament and throughout modern times, when God chooses to circumvent natural law and perform a miracle, allow miraculous intervention, we might say. He always has an intent. There is always a purpose. And let me tell you what it's not. God is not trying to amaze us. He's not trying to entertain us. He's not even trying to get our attention, per se. When God does the supernatural, he is pointing to evidence of his presence. And we miss that. He is pointing to evidence of his presence and his intervention. In the Old Testament, miracles were evidence of God's anointing upon his servants. When Moses struck the rock and got water out uh, when uh, the quail fell from heaven, uh, uh, when the, the, the pillow of fire, all of the parting of the seas, all of those things that God did by in, the, in, the, in the day of Moses was done supernaturally to a, to a point to draw attention to the fact that Moses was God's man. Same was true later on with Elijah and, and others. We come to the New Testament, in the Gospels, miracles give us evidence, real signs, tangible, visible signs that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, in John 10, these religious folks were missing that intent, that perspective, that purpose behind the supernatural. Jesus did not turn the water into wine. He did not feed the 5,000 on the last lunch. He did not walk on the water. He did not, these miracles were not done to entertain, to amaze, to draw attention. No, no. Every time Jesus performed a miracle, it was to draw attention to the fact, to the truth that the Messiah had come. He was God's anointed. He was the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. And the miracles were there to attest to that reality, not to draw crowds. Now, 
in modern times, we've had faith healers. We've had, quote, miracle workers who have traveled far and wide uh, pilling their wares. They've grown great crowds. And their intent is to build an audience. Their intent, and you can see it in the way they carry themselves and uh, the promotional um, tactics that they use, these miracle workers, these faith healers often, often are drawing attention to themselves. We know from that that the heart is wrong. In the book of Acts, miracles attested to the authentic messengers of the gospel, the apostles and others whom God had anointed to take the gospel uh, from Jerusalem into the uttermost parts of the earth. The miracles attested to God's anointing upon these, these messengers. And today, when God chooses to work miraculously, to intervene in the natural processes miraculously, he's drawing attention to Jesus, not the man, not the ministry, not even those who are being helped. The attention goes to exalting Jesus Christ, the Savior. Jesus said this, if I be lifted up, I, not you, I would draw all men unto myself. This is the real purpose behind God's supernatural intervention. So that means that miracles are not promotional tactics. They're not designed to draw a crowd. Jesus would have still been the Messiah without the supernatural signs. But it was to show Israel that he was the Messiah, not to impress with great crowds. Miracles are not humans with supernatural powers, and that takes us especially to the, to the faith healers of our time. Listen, it's very important that we understand those men and women have no supernatural powers whatsoever. None. Every supernatural intervention in human history is God stepping into time and evidencing his presence. Now, the supernatural acts that are of darkness rather than light have a diabolical meaning, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in just a minute. Also, miracles are no substitute for faith. In fact, faith is really right the opposite the Bible says that faith is the substance of things not seen, or uh, things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. They're not visible. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says we are to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So miracles are no substitute for faith. By the way, as we're going to see, uh, in just a moment, we have to be very, very, very careful about what our eyes see, what our ears hear, because things are not always as they seem. Now, Jesus says to here uh, to the folks in John 10, he said, you must be mine to discern these things. We're living in a time more so than any era in human history when those people who were hearing the voices in this world must be discerning. Jesus had more to say about deception than any other subject throughout his ministry. He had more about to say about deception than he did heaven or hell. Why? Because he knew, in fact, he says this in Matthew 24, Luke 21. Uh, he tells us that the time is coming when deception is going to be so cunning, so clever, so absolutely, absolutely mesmerizing that it's going to captivate the masses of the world. Miracles are no substitute for truth. Truth is not transit. It's not it's not relative, it's absolute. Truth is absolute. So we have to 
we have to come with this understanding that miracles alone can either be good or bad. Let's look at what we're saying here. John chapter 10 and verse 25, he says here, I told you you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. In other words, look at the person behind the works. In Exodus chapter 7, we find a very interesting portion of Scripture. As you'll remember the story, God sent Moses down to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel who had been in bondage and slavery as a nation, as a race, as a people for about 400 years. And so God gives Moses the mission of leading them out. And, of course, Moses had uh, some, some legitimate concerns, and he voiced those concerns uh, to God in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. And finally, uh, the rod came up, and uh, Jesus, uh, the, the Lord said to him out of the burning bush, what is that in your hand? He said, what is a rod? And you know the story. He threw it down and became a snake. He picked it up. It became a stick again. What we learn very interestingly a few chapters over in chapter 7 is this. The magicians and the astrologers, the soothsayers, the fortune tellers, those dabbling in the dark arts were also capable of performing supernatural events. Very disturbing. They were able to mimic and duplicate each of the plagues that Moses authorized from the command of God. They reproduced them until they couldn't. And this reminds us, folks, that evil has its limits. It can do a lot, and they're going to continue to do that. We're going to look, and I want you to turn right now to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to see something here that is most disturbing, and we're living in the era where these things now are possible. But in, in chapter 13, let's go there for, for this moment. I want you to see this very important thing. Signs and wonders will increase as the time approaches uh, what has been commonly labeled the end of days. So here we are. We're in chapter 13. Here's what it says. Look at verse 15. Well, let's go back to verse 14. He deceived them. This is the one, this is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is talking here, and he says, Great wonders. In verse 13, he makes fire come down out of heaven. And all the people begin to be mesmerized, amazed by what this one that the Bible refers as to the man of sin, the Antichrist. Keep reading. And he does great wonders that he make the fire come down. Verse 14, he deceiveth, circle that word, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. You're learning, as are we, about a lot of the technology, virtual reality. We all use virtual assistants every single day. Uh, every time you say, hey, Siri, and you give a command, you're talking to a virtual assistant. Uh, there's Siri, there's Alexa, there's any number that are out there now. They're proliferating. They're all around us, and they do various things. Uh, but we have come not only to recognize them but to depend upon them for things. Uh, it is nothing to get in the car and use your virtual assistant as you're going down the road to make phone calls, send text messages, read emails, you name it. Uh, the capabilities are growing and expanding. But that's just one. That's a, that's a, a virtual assistant. Virtual reality is on a different level. It actually tricks our minds into believing that we, are, we have been immersed into certain virtual, not real, virtual environments. And even that now is becoming child's play, toys of virtual reality. We have something new. You're hearing a lot about it in 2013, uh, 2023, I should say. In 2023, we're hearing a lot about something called artificial intelligence. When you, uh, when you drive up to a Wendy's uh, drive-thru, uh, Arby, some of the others uh, are using it as well. 
you have artificial intelligence, not a real human being that's taking your order. You don't even know it. The voice sounds human. Everything about it is normal. Uh, the interaction's normal, but you're talking to artificial intelligence. Now a lot of your Google searches uh, uh, and other searches on the Internet, the World Wide Web, are done with artificial intelligence. Uh, just the other day, one of my posts on uh, social media was flagged, and uh, this company is owned by Meta, and it's heavily invested in artificial intelligence, and it said our technology has tagged a post. Not real humans, not real humans, but artificial intelligence, a technology bot has flagged uh, a post. And what this really means is that they now have the power to execute policy in corporations, especially in so social media. That's disturbing. But here's what he says. He's going to deceive people with these miracles, but it gets worse. Verse 15. And he had the power to give life into the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused us all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. It was, in, it was mandated that they receive the mark. It is the artificial intelligence apparatus that is speaking through this image, this, this visible manifestation of the Antichrist that has been created. This new image speaks, and it speaks as a man speaks. It causes folks to, uh, to have to take the mark of the beast if they want to, to involve themselves in commerce, to buy and to sell. So this is where we're going with this. We're going to see increasingly amazing, powerful, sensational occurrences in our world. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, if it were possible, if it were possible, even the very elect will be deceived. You can no longer trust what you see. You can no longer trust what you hear. What you can still trust, my friend, is God's holy word. We must become students of this book so that we know what it says. We know what it says. Not well, uh, I think I read something like this the other day in the Bible. I'm not quite sure of where it's at. I'm not quite sure of exactly what it says. But I think it said this. Uh, that's insufficient, folks. I'm not being critical. I'm not. But that's not enough. You must know the truth because that's what liberates us. We must understand that we're living in days when deception is going to be greater than it's ever been in all of human history. Paul warns Timothy, he says, deceivers will continue to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deception is pandemic. It is a far greater pandemic than COVID ever thought about being. Deception is worldwide. There's all sorts of things that we can't even, we don't have time even to get into today but you better know the truth. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, God is going to continue to do miracles. He always has. He always will. He created everything. It's his right to involve himself, to invoke himself, to put himself into time and do whatever he chooses to do in our lives. We who know him and we know his word, we have the capabilities of recognizing what he's doing, what it is, and why he's doing it. I will tell you this. All the supernatural occurrences that come from God will always lead you back to Jesus. Any supernatural occurrences that take you away from him, make you want to think or believe something other than Jesus, is false, it's diabolical, it's deceptive, it's harmful. Stay away from it. Run from it. 
Our time is gone today. I hope that you are enjoying this series uh, on Truth Question. We'll be back again with you next week. And until that time, God bless you.